a little late for, uh, for lectures. Um, I would quite like to have my, uh, um, my meal this evening as well, but uh, we'll do that later. Okay, um, so let's go on to the, the next question. Um, so the next question is about finite impulse response filters. So let's have a look at the first part of this question. Um, so this one, um, 35 marks for this one. So it's quite a substantial bit of description, uh, this one. So this is um, a book work type part of the question. Explain how a finite impulse response filter can be designed to approximate an ideal filter using a Fourier series method. In your answer, describe what happens to the frequency response of the filter when the Fourier series is truncated to finite length and outline how to compensate for this issue. So there are sort of three parts to the question really. First one um, about uh, designing the filter um, using this ideal filter using a Fourier series method. So, so what about the first part? How are we going to start with this question? What's, how do we describe um, the starting point for this FIR filter design? Does somebody want to give me a sort of an outline idea about how do you design a finite impulse response starting from an ideal filter response? Okay, well, suppose this, this uh, question had come up in the exam. Um, where are you going to start? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, so it's probably best not to call it an infinite impulse response filter because that will be uh, a later question, in, or at least in the, in the revision part here. But yeah, sure enough, we start with a the finite impulse response filter method, we first start by starting from the ideal filter that we want and then finding the in the time domain what would be the response for that filter. So um, if I just um, write on this part of the question, let's, let's just go down to some spare space that we've got in here. So we've got um, maybe frequency response here that we want. This is our frequency response um, as a function of f. This is our h of f that we want. And we need to convert that to a time domain representation. And because our frequency response looks like this boxcar function, what's this going to look like in the time domain? It's going to be a sync function. Yeah, so we're going to have a sine x over x function, and so we can, as we space these out, it'll be a sine x over x type function like this. Which, sure enough, has an infinite impulse response, but then what we're going to do is truncate that and window it. So this is really the, the main part of this question. If we, um, if we think of, of our method, we start with the ideal filter for the response that we want, where we've got some sort of omega C cutoff frequency here. We work out what the time domain representation for that would be. And of course, this has got to be a sampled ver version, so it would be sampled in time. And um, then we're going to window that. So the Fourier series method, why does the Fourier series method come up when we're doing this um, transform here? Why is it a Fourier series rather than a Fourier transform that we use? Yeah, because it's periodic. So if you were stuck about what the Fourier series is, then you can look in the data book. You'll have this data book. It's called the Department of Electronic Engineering Table of Constants and Formulae and something. And on page seven, 
um, is a page about series. And in that page seven is this Fourier series. So it gives two different forms for this. The one that I've tended to use is this two-sided form um, that uses exponential terms here. But the fact is that it, if it's periodic, then we can use this. So we can use the Fourier series when something is periodic. So in the case of going back to the question here, what is it that's periodic in this system? Yeah, the frequency response is periodic because it's a sampled system. So we've got uh, uh, these frequencies up here. The response of the system repeats at the sampling frequency. And so because of that, the frequency response is periodic. That's why we can use the Fourier series. So we use the Fourier series to do essentially an inverse Fourier transform for something that's periodic in the frequency yeah, domain. So that's really the first part of that of that answer. We'll scroll back up to up to here. So that's the first part of using the Fourier series method. So say you can start from the ideal response, you can say why the Fourier series method method is used because it's periodic in the frequency domain. That's the first sentence. And then the next bit, describe what happens to the frequency response of the filter when the Fourier series is truncated and outline how to compensate for this. So we use the Fourier series method, but in the frequency domain instead of the time domain. So we have to do some substitutions to get into the, the time domain form. But yes, we're using the Fourier series. It's, it's a sort of inverse Fourier series, but we're using Fourier series, but we just use, instead of, um, let's, let's bring the formula booklet in here. Instead of this being f of t, this is going to be h of f, where h is the response of our filter in frequency. So we need to substitute time for frequency in this formula in order to apply it. But otherwise, we can do that, and we end up with the um, filter tap, the, the filter impulse response, as the parameters that come out from down here. Um, there's a technicality of the fact they're time reversed because we have to change the size. But um, otherwise, for, for a symmetrical filter, which we usually get, we don't mind. So that's that method you can follow through from the, um, uh, the tutorial we did with that. It's also in the solution um, from here. It talks about the, the method. And in fact, in part B, we'll be using that method later. But let's just continue with part A for the moment. So what happens to the frequency response to the filter when it's truncated? So let's have a look at our diagram down here. When we truncate the filter at some point here, what happens to the frequency response that we've got when we truncate the filter? Anyone, anyone fall, fall further towards the back one suggest? What happens when we truncate the time delay? Yes. Um, not really. Um, so if we think of what happens when we do truncation, truncation means that we're going to set all the things outside of here to zero. So really what we're doing is we're multiplying by a boxcar function where we keep all the values at one here and all the values at the other side to zero. So we're going to be multiplying by something here. That means in the frequency domain, if we multiply in the time domain, what happens in the frequency domain? We convolve. Yeah. So we convolve with a sink. And in this case, it's a sort of, it's quite a narrow 
sink. That's what we convolve by. But what it does to this is it gives ringing on the edges of all these filter responses. So instead of the filter response being nice and square like this, let's push that up a bit, we get this sort of ringing effects. Like that on each of the edges. Anyone remember what this is called, this ringing effect? It's called the something phenomenon. Gibbs phenomenon. You have to remember this one. And you can make the truncation longer, but the heights of this stay the same. So the heights of the ripples still stay as, as high. They tighten up towards the edges, but they still stay um, as high there. So what that means is that the pass band isn't always unit response here, which is what we want. And the stop band also lets through, has some ripples, which appear as side bands in here. And when we've done the FIR filter design, we've seen that effect where we get these side lobes in the response, and they're caused by the ripple of the truncation. So then the last part of the question is, how do we compensate for this problem? So what have we just done in lab four um, when we were doing compensating for, for this problem? How do we improve the situation? So instead of just truncating with a rectangular window, what else do we use? We could use a Hamming window or a Hamming window or something like that. So instead of multiplying by that, we multiply by something that's uh, sort of maybe more like a raised cosine type window. Multiply by that. And that would give us some smoother <laughs> ripples, smaller ripples, um, but a sort of slower slope. So, so we would end up with, the ripples would be smaller, but the slope here would be longer for the same window. So that's how we, that's the sort of compensation um, that we get for that. So this part of the question for there needs quite a bit of explanation. So it's looking for quite a bit of background that you've understood about how you do this process. Okay, so that's part, that's part A done. Part B, this is now 50%. So this is about 20 minutes of your um, of your time on this one, about half the question um, for, um, for this one. Um, so here, using a Hamming window, width nine e n equals nine elements, design an FIR digital filter operating at something frequency 48 kilohertz, to approximate an ideal low pass filter uh, with unit gain in the pass band and six kilohertz cut off frequency, and give you a response and transfer function of the filter. And here, you're given the Hamming window function. So you're not, it tells you use a Hamming window, you're not expected to remember what the formula is for a Hamming window. So this is going to be similar to what we did in the lectures, also in the tutorials. For lab four, you didn't need to do this calculation because the calculation was done for you in the software, but this was essentially the method that you used. But let's have a look at the method of where we'd, we would start. So we need to design an FIR filter with sampling frequency 48 kilohertz to approximate a filter up to 6 kilohertz. Well, let's just find ourselves some space down, uh, down here for the moment. So what we're doing is designing a filter with a 48 kilohertz uh, cut off um, this is our sampling, sorry, sampling frequency is 48 kilohertz, Nyquist 24 kilohertz, and our cutoff frequency um, is 6 kilohertz, FC 6 kilohertz. So this is our filter response here, and also because it's periodic, we'll have something similar here, something similar. So this will be periodic, repeating every 48 kilohertz. 
So this is now where we can use the Fourier series. We can use the Fourier series on this frequency domain here, F, and rather than trying to remember the Fourier series, uh, you can pull it out from the data book from here. So we've got the Fourier series here. Um, we have to do the substitutions that we gave in the lecture. So instead of an F of T, we've got an H of F. I'd probably start with an X of T here to start with, just so you don't com confuse frequency and function F. So one of the things here is about multiple use of the same variables. But here we've got F of T is this sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity, alpha of n, e to the j, n, n given t, where alpha of n is this 1 over 2, e to the j, f of t, minus j, n, n given t, t. This is going to be our filter coefficients. And so, um, actually, if we look at the, the solution in the, um, in the paper solution, this is how we calculate the coefficient. So our h of n is 1 over fs. So we've done the substitution here. Integral from minus fs over 2 to plus fs over 2. h of f e to the 2 pi j f n t, where t is 1 over fs. So we've done the substitutions here already to do that. Now our h of f, let's just pull this out at the top of this part of the question here. This is the integral that we do between minus fs over 2 to plus fs over 2. This is the integral range that we're doing. But the cutoff frequency is at 6 kilohertz. So actually everything outside of here is zero. So we only need to do the integral over this range. And over this range, the height is 1, because that's the frequency response that we want. So that's what we need to substitute in for our anchor there. It's 1 in this way, and 0 otherwise. So that, that means, in the case of 6 kilohertz, that's actually 1 eighth of our mass. And if we use it in this term, then we'll cancel out some things later on, say, and derive by the equations. So we integrate from minus fs over a to plus fs over a. By the time we do the integral, we'll get our familiar thing, <laughs> sine x over x term at the bottom. So if we just follow through this, I won't go through in detail, but this will be, be a quarter of sin. You can, if you want to, solve this using the Fourier series with the, um, the sine plus cosine form. So, actually, just to go back to this one, um, if you're more familiar with this term when you've got cos plus sine terms, um, you can use that formula instead. But what you'll find um, is that you'll get um, an integral of the cos terms the, the sign terms here um, are odd terms because we've got an even frequency. This integral. So you can try it that way around if you want to instead. So don't forget that you've got the data book that you can use to get that uh, formula out if you, if you want. So that gets us to the formula at the bottom there. Once we've got this one, Actually, even if you don't remember exactly what this is, you'll probably remember it's some sort of sink curve. So if you get stuck, just say, oh, it's some sort of sink curve something, and then do the rest with the calculation. Then we can do the calculation. And that's uh, a matter of plugging in the numbers. We've got n equals 9, so that's a center tap plus 4 either side. So we've got n equals 0 and it's a symmetrical filter so we need one two three and four to calculate out as it turns out h of four will be equal to zero here so ac so actually although it's in theory a nine tap filter uh, we only end up with um seven non-zero taps in this particular case just because the spinal tap 
So if we calculate those values using a calculator, um, when you're using a calculator to do it, remember to put your calculator in radian mode. Otherwise, you'll end up calculating your signs in degrees mode and all the numbers will come out really tiny. Because sine of pi is 180 degrees in radians, sine of pi by 2 is 1 in radians. Sine of pi by 2 is sine of, if you're in degrees, is about sine of 1.5 degrees, which is a very small number. So just check that you're in radians mode. Maybe do sine of pi by 2 just to check. Um, then the Hanning window, this just comes from the formula that we're given, but it should be one in the middle, and go down to something smaller, and then multiply those together. And then that's the result. Um, so we're going to leave the things at the end, um, and the final sh thing that we want to make it causal is we need to shift it so that instead of the zero point in the middle, we have the zero point in the middle. So that's now our final final build. So it's quite involved that part, but actually once we've done a few of these, we can practice the tutorial. Any questions on this one so far? Okay, so then the last part of this question, this is a bit of a challenging part. So suppose you now want to design um, a high pass operating at 14 kilohertz with a cutoff frequency of 18 kilohertz. Outline how you can adapt your design to achieve this. Okay, so although I gave you the answer for that one, we've built in the first part a low pass filter that cuts off at 6 kilohertz. How might that be related to a high pass filter that cuts off at 18 kilohertz? What does our high pass filter mean? Where's the, where's the highest possible frequency? Sampling frequency is 40 kilohertz. 24 kilohertz. Okay. So 24 kilohertz, suppose it's high pass from 18 to 24 kilohertz. What's that range from 18 to 24? How far is that? 6 kilohertz. Okay, we've just designed a low pass filter to work at 6 kilohertz. So how do you think we're going to take a low pass filter? that operates from minus 6 to plus 6 and convert it into a high pass filter that operates from 24 minus 6 to 24 plus 6. So we want to shift it in the frequency domain. Okay, any thoughts about how we might shift something in the frequency domain? What would you have to do in time to shift something in the frequency? We've done communication reports, we've done something about how do you take something in baseband and shift it up to some um, frequency that you want to transmit it to. Multiplication of time, yeah, um, called modulation. So in this particular case, actually the way to do this is that you multiply every other sample by minus one. Um, and that's multiplied by something at the numbers frequency. Because if it's plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, that's a half sample. And if you do that, then you'll convert the low pass filter into a high pass filter. So that's one solution that you can, you can do. Um, this will be the filter that you can get. Um, you could instead talk about redesigning with different filter types, filter numbers. So you could instead change the cutoff frequency as part of your integration. That would be another way that you can talk about it.
Um, so this this new special case happens to be tracking from minus plus six It doesn't always happen like that, but there are some modifications that you can do. For example, if you wanted to convert this filter, um, here's the, the low pass filter version, if you wanted to convert it into a high pass filter with a cutoff frequency of 6 kHz, you could take a, an all pass filter, that's something with a delta of 1, and subtract this low pass filter from it. So you'd end up with a 1 in the middle, except then you'd subtract the filter numbers that you had. So actually you would end up with um, whatever filter that we designed here, here's the filter that we designed here, all of those multiplied by minus one, plus one in the middle, so you'd actually end up with so there are a few of these modifications that you can do when you're converting one filter to another. Um, to go from low pass to high pass um, without changing the cutoff frequency, you take a delta function, which is an all pass filter, and then subtract the filter that you've done with the low pass. Do you know how we can have a convolutional table? That's what I'm looking at. When we want to change the cutoff frequency, it's not forgot. always so straightforward. Oh, you forgot it. In this particular case, okay. where we want to yeah. the rules. Let me try to understand from the dentist. Instead to do that one, we need to do by So right, I'm going back to the lecture and on that tutorial question. Just to figure out how I did it. So you can see this part of the question is actually quite challenging. It's not something that we've covered in the lectures, it goes beyond what we've done already. So it's really looking for a very deep understanding of the question that we've got to get those last um, few marks of the question. But to be fair uh, for that one, this is only asking for 15% of the marks. So you get 85% of the marks by doing the normal marks. That's really just to get those last few marks. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? So we spent quite a bit of time on, on that one because that's one of the sort of calculation type questions that we've done before and also it uses. This one, well, this is related to Lab 5. Um, we did last week for just to show you Lab 5 submission, by the way, as, as you what it is on Surrey Learn rather than in the next lab. Uh, so, um, so for here, briefly describe the principles behind the binding and the transform method of design and design. Okay, so in a hand waving sense, what is the bilinear Z transform method? What types of digital filters are we talking about? I I R filters. What is the idea behind it? What do we do? When we use the bilinear transform, what type of design do we to build our this? Do you want to give me an outline of where we start and how we end up with the What, what type of filter do we start with? Yeah, we start with an analog filter. So we're, we're starting in the analog domain with filters that people have known how to design as an analog filter. Things like Butterworth filter, Chebyshev filter, 
um, elliptic filters and others. There are many other types of filters that people design. Yes. Analog so that's where we start. And then we need to convert that filter into a digital filter. And this is where the bilinear Z transform method comes in. So, what is it about the bilinear Z transform method? What is it that, how do we convert an analog filter to a digital filter using this Z transform? Yeah. So in particular, the, the key bit of information that will help in this method, and you're using this one, but not using the question, so you'll need to remember this one, is the formula of for the bilinear Z So the S the 2 over T Z minus 1 over Z plus 1. Or you might want to remember that as 2 over T into 1 minus Z minus 1 over 1 plus Z minus 1. Either is OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you design an analog filter in S domain and then you convert it into a digital filter in the Z domain by using this bilinear transform. It's called bilinear because bilinear, there are sort of two linear bits to it. It's a division of one linear formula divided by another. In itself, this transform is not a linear transform, it's a bilinear transform. Okay, so then, so we've got this transform. So what's the point then of free warping? What does this formula bring up? We did this in lab five. We needed to do pre walking. Yes. So, does anyone else want to echo that? So, what do we do with why we need the pre walk? What does it get us? specifications for filters are given in the digital domain. These are the specifications we want the digital filter to do. But we need to work out what the filter responses are of the analog filter that we're going to design and convert back into the digital domain. So that's why pre-warping is needed. And the pre-warping formula tells us take this digital frequency that we just did, and it might be stopped at 18 kilohertz. And convert it into an analog frequency that we're going to use to design our analog filter. Then we design, design the analog filter, and then we apply this formula to get us back into a digital filter. And um, you can show, I think as part of one of the tutorial exercises, you can show that um, if you apply this formula to things on the unit circle, then it will do this to them. So you can actually confirm So that's really the method. So that's really the explanation for that part of the question. Again, that's um, uh, that's defined in the uh, uh, in the answer for that one. But we've got 30 marks for that question. So there's quite a bit um, of the question is is um, based on that book work. So make sure that you can do this background explanation. So the rest of the question, this is um, actually quite a long part for this question. There are multiple parts for this. Um, it's a design question. 
If you get stuck part way through, just carry on and do as many parts as you can do. Um, even if you think you've gone wrong somewhere, um, the markers are quite used to following through the method to see where the steps have, have gone, even if there's a mistake early on. So here we've got um, an infinite impulse response, IIR filter. We've got specifications of stop band frequency and attenuation, cutoff frequency and attenuation, and we are asked to design the filter, giving it pulse transfer function and difference equation. So this is a, an IIR filter design process. And there are several steps to that. Let's follow through all the steps. Um, so I'm slightly running out of time, so I'll sort of gloss over some of the steps here, um, but just show you what they are. But just as a note, the things that you'll need, like Butterworth filter order, Butterworth filter prototypes, are given in the question. So um, when, you, when you do these, the formulas are here, just make sure that you can read the formula and understand um, how that's applied. So IIR filter, this is what we've got. What's our first step going to be if we've got this filter specification first step that we want to do when we want to design an analog filter. So we're going to start with this digital filter spec, we want to transform it to the analog domain, design the analog filter, and then convert it back into the digital domain. So what's our first step? What, what's the first thing we need to do with these numbers? Yeah, we need to do pre-warping. So we need to take these numbers, the stop band at 18 kilohertz, the cutoff frequency at 9 kilohertz, and we need to do pre-warping to get those into the analog domain. So here we are, we've got um, cutoff frequency um, here in radians per second. Um, we need to make sure that we remember the two pi in here because we're given this formula using um, the analog um, uh, rather than a frequency in hertz, it's a frequency in radians per second. Um, so we need to make sure that we use the angular frequency here. Uh, we calculate the formula uh, through here and we end up with um, an analog frequency uh, of, well I've written it here as 2 over t times 0.72654. I tend to keep the 1 over t in here because in many cases we'll find we'll um, this will cancel out later on, so we might hang on to that. But if you want to, you can calculate the whole thing. T is just the sampling period here. So with our, um, that's our uh, frequency, one over 45 kilohertz. <laughs> so that's the cutoff frequency. Similarly, the stop band frequency. So we can see we've still we've got two analog frequencies now. 2 over t times 0.7 and 2 over t times 3. So that's the first step. So that's the first thing we need to do. You can see on the marks here that although they're not visible in the question, um, 20 marks have been given for that. So roughly 10 marks for each one of those um, pre warping for me. So step two, we need to calculate the filter order. In particular, we've got this formula, which includes this um, um, A2, which is our um, uh, stop band suppression, uh, stop band attenuation. We've got omega S over omega C, which is the two frequencies we've just calculated in the analog domain. We're now in the analog domain here. We need to calculate the filter order for this one. Calculating that gives us a2 over 10, so that's about 99. Log of that is, is just over 2, just under 2. Um, this ratio gives us about 4.2 here. Calculating out the formula gives us n for the breaking of So we need to use filter order breaking 2. So that's the next step. That one gets us about 10 marks for doing that. I think confusing. Now we need to choose the right prototype. So we're given a set of prototypes um, in the question. Let's just see them in the question. We're given these set of prototypes. That's the 
uh, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3 prototypes for up to thir third order. So we need to choose the second order prototype. So this is the prototype we use. And that's the one if our cutoff frequency was equal to 1. If it's not equal to 1, we need to scale s by the cutoff frequency. So that's the next step. So this is now scaled by our cutoff frequency. And so that's the substitution in there. And this is where the T cancels, because the omega C has got our cutoff frequency, that will include something. In terms of so that's another 10 marks. So there's quite a few steps in here. Each bit gets some marks. So even if you forget about how to do some other part, you could say, suppose your prototype number came out of 15. Clearly that's wrong. So you could say, let's suppose actually it was n equals 2. You could start again from here and then go on to the next steps. So you can actually show that you can use the rest of the method, even if you messed up something earlier. So next part, now we use the bilinear transform. We've got this um, we've got this prototype that we had over the page. We substitute s for 2 over t, 1 minus z minus 1 over 1 plus z minus 1, or if you prefer, z minus 1 over z plus 1. And we note that s over omega c is 1 over omega c times s. And so, because of our omega c was this value here, the t's cancel out on here, so that's going to make it easier. So actually, s over omega c is 1.37, which is 1 over 1.725 times the back one. So that means, when we look at the things that we can do, uh, s over omega c squared, which is that term with a, it should actually be so therefore, when we substitute all of that, here, this is just taking this 1 over s squared plus root 2s plus 1, and oh, doing that substitution after a little bit. I remember this now. Not very interesting. Uh, yes. This table. Solution now? Yeah, I also understand. Cool. Maybe I can do that question So that's our Z transform. Again, if you didn't quite, if you think it doesn't look, look right, you can try it anyway. The Z transform part. The final part is to turn that into a different equation. So we did that in one of the questions earlier on, which is the Z transform turns into a different equation. H of Z is Y Z over X of Z. Multiply the denominators by both sides and then try and inverse the Z transform, which is our formula. And the nicest way to do this is is to make sure that it's y of n in terms of the So here we had the for y of n because this um, cleanest way is to divide through by n and get y of n. And this is our final. So it's quite involved, that part, but each of the steps are quite logical. So if you need to just remember each of the steps and where you're going. So we're going from the digital domain into the analog domain, and to do that we need to warp it. We work out our filter order and choose the right filter. And so that means calculating the filter order, and then given that, um, and then selecting the prototype, um, and then we convert it back into the digital domain by doing the substitution of S into um, 2 over T, Z plus 1 over Z minus 1. The, uh, sorry, Z minus 1 over Z plus 1 for the um, bilinear transform formula, and then finally doing the inverse transform. So each of the steps is quite straightforward, even if there are multiple things involved. For that. And that's, that's it for that one. So that one's done. Any questions about that one?
Okay, so just to go on to the last one, and I'll do this quite quickly because we're, I know we're running a little bit out of time. Um, this one, uh, question five. So the first one is recently done this work in the last couple of weeks. Um, will the focus, focus on the one? Better. Okay. So, um, explain what's meant by decimation and interpolation and why the filter is needed. Well, we've talked about that over the last couple of, couple of lectures. So um, so I did. Also called up sampling and downsampling. The filter is there to get rid of the aliasing problems that we would otherwise have. <laughs> So what the tutorial? it's got four to no, the center of the mask, so you want slightly more involved um, on you know how that. to answer. But that's essentially which question? Um, more, more to the part B, the yeah, which specific question? Um, here we've got the signal <laughs> sample of the The topic of this It's going to be decimated. Ah, I did tutorial, but I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, do, do you think it's really uh, difficult? The first part is not difficult if you remember, if you remember the steps, because the first part is, the first part is just, this is actually pretty um, you just have a frequency, you just have to remember the decimation factor. So, um, I think the, um, the solution is not too bad, I think the interpolation is very hard. In the exam, so, um, I think it's because it's two decimation, which is the signal being decimated, has not it? Down a short solution for that. So it's getting small. Um, but actually, so um, if you look at the solution okay. for question five in the tutorial, I think it's tricky as well. Um, but once you. Um, well, this goes one part of it's not too bad as a drawing a graph. The second part is um, so doing the summation, which is the one. So you need to know what you're doing, <laughs> and I don't know what I'm doing. I think over top is actually kind of hard. To uh, so the numbers are different on for question five, but the next is just the same. Um, so that's um, that's pretty much it for that one. The last um, those two parts are to calculate two-stage decimator and the one-stage decimator. So um, if you've practiced and done a lot of those, it could be that those answers come out fairly quickly. So really, I think that's, that's everything I want to cover. I hope that was useful, even though uh, actually there may be things that you've forgotten from the beginning of the course, and that, that gives you an idea of some of the things you might want to go back and remind yourself of. Um, I th think some key things are really just to make sure that you answer all of the parts of the questions that you can. Um, check your calculators in the right mode. Um, there are a list of, I've written down some exam tips um, on, the, um, on the past exam papers uh, questions. So things to avoid that I've seen as the sort of simple mistakes that people have made in the past. So just check that you don't make those mistakes um, and then you should be fine. Um, so good luck with finishing off Lab 5 for submission tomorrow um, and good luck with the exams in January and have a good break over the Christmas and New Year period. Okay, bye for now, thanks very much.